I have here a statue of the Buddha in what's known as the earth-touching gesture, or Bhumi Sparsha. And what I want to ask today is whether we have misunderstood this gesture over the years, whether we're seeing it in a way that's somewhat different from what the way that people would have seen it at the time, at least some people. So how do we see it now? Well, many of us will see it as an example of when the Buddha defeated Mara. That is to say that the Buddha, who was in the night of his enlightenment, was beset by Mara, the tempter, who was tempting him with various things. And after having made a, an oath of a certain kind, that he had the karmic potency, he touched the earth, and Mara was defeated, and in that moment the Buddha became enlightened. That is to say that this gesture, at least to many of us, symbolizes that momentary breakthrough, that touching of the way things really are, yata bhutang, as it said in Pali, the way things really are, that led, that led directly to his enlightenment. As one recent art historian has put it, at the moment of enlightenment, the prince reaches his right hand towards the ground in a gesture of calling the earth to witness his spiritual awakening. In doing so, he becomes the Buddha. This presents us with a very powerful image of instantaneous transformation, which I would submit is one of the reasons why this particular image is, is so important, is so, has been so powerful down the, the centuries and millennia. But I submit that at the time it was created, it would not have looked that way to many of the people who were in the audience, many of the people who were associated with the image. And in that, there's something of a story. We know that this image arose at a contested time in the history of Buddhist iconography. The image probably arose somewhere around the second century of the Common Era, perhaps late in the first century. And this was at the end of what's known as the Buddhist aniconic period. There was a period, uh, again, ending around then, when there was a general disincentive to portray the Buddha in human form. Instead, the Buddha was represented as a kind of an absence through perhaps his footprints or through the, 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 the visualization of an empty throne or of a riderless horse. Images such as these that did not represent, again, the Buddha in human form, but simply his absence. But apparently, under sculptural traditions from other sources, in particular from Hellenism in the West, that is, Greek and Roman uh, 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 representational techniques, as well as coinage from other parts of the world, Greece, Rome, and other places that involved images of kings and so on. This whole disincentive to portray the Buddha in human form seems to have begun to wane. However, it waned over a period of time. And indeed, there seems to have been a particularly contested period of time when it was relatively okay to portray the Bodhisattva, that is to say, the unenlightened Buddha, but was not particularly okay yet, not particularly thought of as correct to portray the image of the enlightened Buddha. Roughly speaking, that contested time seems to have been roughly again from the first to the fourth centuries of the Common Era, which is exactly when this image seems to have first arisen. But that presents us with a problem, because isn't this an example of the Buddha, of a fully enlightened Buddha? Isn't this an example, as we've said, of the moment of enlightenment? To understand why it's not, we need to look at the literary evidence, because although it looks like we can just read this image off from how it, how it appears to us, in fact, there's a pretty deep and detailed story that seems to go with it. And I did a recent video on a little bit of that story. I'll leave a link to that down below. I did a paper about this, which I'll also leave a link down below. Now, these literary tales don't seem to go back any further than the origins of this image. That is to say, these literary stories 
seem to originate, roughly speaking, around the second century of the Common Era. And these stories differ in many respects, in virtually all respects. There are many different versions of the story to go with this image. But all of the stories agree on one basic fact. That fact is that this image, this touching of the earth, or this gesture, is not associated with the Buddha's enlightenment. Instead, it's associated with the defeat of Mara, which is not the same thing. The defeat of Mara, in fact, is the overcoming of the five hindrances to meditation. These hindrances are uh, analogized to the armies of Mara, the, the various ways that, that our mind plays tricks on us that doesn't allow us to get into deep states of meditative absorption. Then, after that, this bodhisattva, this Buddha-to-be, spends the entire night deepening his meditative absorption, deepening, getting into deeper and deeper states of meditation, until reaching enlightenment, attaining enlightenment, just at the break of dawn, many hours after the defeat of Mara. Now, given that description, given this literary evidence, what the texts say, we can now understand why it's incorrect, as we heard earlier, to describe this as, at the moment of enlightenment, the prince reaches his right hand towards the ground in a gesture of calling the earth to witness his spiritual awakening. In doing so, he becomes the Buddha. Because, in fact, from a literary perspective, it's undeniable that this is not an image of the Buddha. This is an image of the Bodhisattva, the Buddha-to-be. And as such, we can see how this image would be much less doctrinally problematic, because it doesn't depict the fully enlightened Buddha. And this makes me wonder whether the literary evidence wasn't invented after the image in order to give it some doctrinal breathing room. Because the image, in, for all intents and purposes, appears to be an image of enlightenment, an image of the attainment of enlightenment. And as I, as I said before, I think that's why this image gains a lot of its didactic power. People at the time, sculptors and others, would have been looking for an image to portray this most important moment in the Buddha's life story. They would have been looking for such an image. And indeed, this is that image. This is this image of this momentary breaking through to seeing things as they are, visualized as a touching of the earth, as a making contact with this perfect equanimity that the earth represents in early Buddhism. It's hard to find an image that represents something as metaphorical, as ethereal, as enlightenment. And I, I, I would submit that this is that image, and yet at the same time, it's not, as we've seen because of the literary evidence. It's both at the same time. The image in a sense, inhabits both worlds at the same time. It inhabits a more doctrinally pure world, where it's the Bodhisattva, and it inhabits a more popular world in which this is an example of the Buddha, indeed of the Buddha at the moment of enlightenment. And, indeed, it's impossible to know how the average person would have seen this image many, many centuries ago when it first arose, but we can look to at least one early example of a description of this image by the Chinese pilgrim Xuanzang, who came on a tour of India in 629 of the Common Era, in the 7th century of the Common Era, and seems to have run across just such an image. And he describes it as a figure or likeness of Tathagata when he first reached the condition of Buddha. The description uh, continues, This is a beautiful figure of Buddha. His right hand hangs down in token that when he was about to reach the fruit of a Buddha. Sh so Xuanzang in the 7th century also saw this example as, or this uh, gesture, this kind of statue, as a statue of the Buddha, as well as 
of being the Bodhisattva on the eve of becoming a Buddha. He saw it in a certain sense in both ways at the same time, which is kind of interesting. Now, if you want to hear more about uh, the art of early Buddhism and a, a show that, as I'm making this video, is still on and display at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, uh, but even when it's gone, uh, I have some photographs from that exhibition and some information about the development of early art in Buddhism. Uh, take a look at this earlier video of mine. I'll leave it up on the screen here if you haven't seen it or would like to take another look. If you're getting something out of these uh, videos of mine, consider taking a look also at my Patreon page and seeing if you want to help support the channel. Thanks so much for watching my videos as well, and we'll catch you on the next one. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.